Today we begin our discussion of angels. I say begin because there are quite a number of questions that have arisen on the subject of angels, and admittedly there's no way we can actually address all of them in one session, so we're looking forward to dedicating our next question and answer session to angels as well. But at the very least, we would like to discuss the opening three questions today. They are somewhat interrelated, and I think on many different levels, they help to introduce us to a profound, almost mystical idea that we encounter repeatedly in the Bible, the angels. So, as a good way to begin, let's start by asking the first question, and let's see where it leads us. What is the Jewish view about angels and their role in the Bible? There seem to be so many contradictions in the way angels are described. For example, Isaiah sees angels with six wings, and Ezekiel sees angels with four wings. Does Jewish tradition resolve all the inconsistencies in these descriptions? Indeed. There's a lot that goes into a question like this, and I suppose a good way of beginning is by, of course, realizing the obvious, realizing something that in all sorts of different ways we have noted over the course of our studies of the Bible together, and that is, the word angel, of course, never appears in the Bible because the Bible wasn't written in English. As for what does appear in the Bible, of course, in the original Hebrew of the Bible, things are not nearly as simple as we would like. Because, in fact, on the one hand, there are many different words that we would probably have to translate all into English as angels in Biblical Hebrew. The great medieval Jewish scholar Rabbi Moses Maimonides identified no fewer than ten different words in Biblical Hebrew that all refer to angels, angels at different levels. On the one hand, then, Part of our problem is we have so many different expressions, and they all inevitably have different connotations, even if we lack the wherewithal to properly appreciate those nuances of difference in translation. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, ironically, these various words for angels, almost invariably, don't specifically refer to angels. Perhaps the most dramatic illustration of that is that the word that is most commonly used in the Bible for angels, in Hebrew, malach, is more literally to be translated as messenger, and as we'll note shortly, there are many instances in which it can only correctly be rendered as messenger and not as angel at all. What's going on in the text? So before we even consider this specific illustration, there's a general issue that I think we need to identify in appreciating what indeed goes on with the text in the Bible. And that is a problem, a major problem, a problem that doesn't have any simple solution at all, that all prophets encounter. Because after all, let's consider what takes place in the prophet's mind. The prophet, all of a sudden, is privy to an experience that is fundamentally, totally different 
from any experience that he has ever encountered in his life in this world. If I can share with you a metaphor also from Rabbi Moses Maimonides, imagine someone walking along on a path in total darkness, on a starless, moonless night, and he sees nothing. And all of a sudden, there is a thunderclap, and lightning illuminates all of the countryside round about. And for that instant, everything becomes clear, except that he's so completely accustomed to going about in the dark, he doesn't even have the means in his mind to grasp what he has just experienced as everything was suddenly illuminated. That's the first problem. That when the prophet encounters prophecy, he lacks the mental apparatus himself to really grasp what he has experienced. Problem number two, even to the extent that he has grasped his experience, he needs some way to articulate it, to express it. Because, you know, we, all of us, think in words. The concepts that we use in that internal dialogue taking place within us are all either literally or on some tacit inner plane verbalized, articulated. But language is a tool for describing experiences in this world, not in that world. So the second limitation is, even to the extent that the prophet partially grasps the prophetic experience, he doesn't have the vocabulary, the language, to be able to properly describe it. And then you get to the third problem. Third problem has to do with us. Because whatever the prophet was thinking, whatever the prophet, the prophet's mind understood, we don't know. We can only read his words in this world and only try to get at a partial understanding of what they mean. If I can share with you a nice, simple illustration of the problem, this from a much more recent author, but I think it helps to drive the point home in our own minds. Imagine yourselves trying to explain to someone who doesn't have a sense of smell what the sense of smell means. So you might say something like, smell is kind of like tasting, except it's tasting the air. The sense comes to you over the air like sound does. So, of course, you, who have a sense of smell, as well as a sense of taste and a sense of hearing, can understand what you mean by that. But can you imagine someone who has never experienced smell? I'll just say, what you're saying makes no sense at all. You can't taste sounds, and you can't hear taste. What does it mean? And, of course, you're right, but he's also right. He's left clueless. So that's the third problem, that even to the extent that the prophet is able to employ the language that we have for this worldly experience in relating to his experiences, we still have the problem of trying to understand what that means to us since we are in prophets. Of course, I can't help but add here that there is a fourth problem that many of us have, and that's the problem of translations. Because besides the question of what the prophet had in mind, when you read his words in translation, you always need to ask yourself, what did the translator have in mind? So on all of these various planes, we have almost insurmountable obstacles to trying to understand 
what the Bible is really telling us when it describes to us something that is literally out of this world and angels after all necessarily are out of this world so again I'm going to repeat this is a general problem that we always need to contend with as we strive to understand what the Bible is telling us about angels and their roles again I'm going to share with you the observation that there are so many different words and yet simultaneously those words don't only refer to what we translate as angels so let's consider some examples to help illustrate this point that is in particular this is from a discussion that we had some time ago that I think may be helpful in considering what we mean here let's begin with Genesis chapter 32 verse 4 and Jacob sent in the Hebrew Malachim Malachim the plural for Malach well I already noted that by far the most common word in biblical Hebrew for angel is Malach so Jacob sent plural Malachim before him to Esau his brother unto the land of Seir the field of Edom what did he send of course one could read this as a reference to angels but it makes so much more sense to understand the reference here as simply being to messengers he sent messengers and he commanded them saying thus shall you say unto my Lord Esau thus says your servant Jacob I have sojourned with Havan and stayed until now and I have oxen asses flocks and so on and so forth and when we get to verse 7 the messengers the Malachim still the same word in biblical Hebrew returned to Jacob saying we came to your brother Esau and so on now again I'm going to reiterate it is the word for angels but here it doesn't mean angels it means messengers in the perfectly mundane sense of the word of course simultaneously we can well appreciate that when we speak of messengers it's not really so far from thinking in terms of messengers of God just so long as we bear in mind that messengers of God aren't just angels they are also frequently people the prophet Haggai in the first chapter of his relatively short chapters of prophecy is described in Haggai chapter 1 verse 12 then spoke Haggai now in the Hebrew it is Haggai Malach Hashem which we might otherwise have translated as angel of God and the words do generally mean precisely that but here obviously we're not talking about angel of God because we're talking about a prophet and the prophet is a human being Haggai God's messenger God's Malach in God's message unto the people said I am with you says God so the angel not here the messenger and the messenger is a prophet this observation is perhaps even more dramatically manifest when we consider the prophecies of Malachi now Malachi is it would seem a name the name indeed of the last of the prophets but we should note that Malachi is a perfectly legitimate word a common word in biblical Hebrew even in, in modern Hebrew it would mean my angel or my messenger so on the one hand of course in the opening verse of Malachi the burden of the word of God to Israel by Malachi we would be inclined to read as the prophet's name unless of course 
Maybe the prophet had a different name. And Malachi here is a title given to him by God. And of course, much the same vein, Malach meaning not angel, but messenger. In Malachi chapter 2, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the Torah at his mouth, for he is Malach Hashem Tzvakot, the messenger of the God of hosts. Well, of course, obviously here we don't mean angel. We're speaking, after all, of the human priest. But he's God's messenger. And the word is Malach. And perhaps even more strikingly, in the third and final chapter of Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in comes, says the God of hosts. Well, as you may well discern at this point, in both instances, the term is Malach. But what's most striking is, the first instance here, I send my messenger, is precisely in Hebrew, Malachi. It's not just pronounced the same way as the prophet's apparent name. It is the prophet's apparent name. And it means my messenger. This, of course, again, pertains to messengers who clearly have a role, a mission, that is given them by God, and they function as such. Well, don't angels also? What makes this ambiguity all the more striking is when we consider it in the context of biblical verses in which it really isn't entirely clear what we mean. Do we mean messengers? Or do we mean angels? In Numbers chapter 20, in verse 14, and Moses sent the Hebrew, Malachim. Let's grant that here we should render that as messengers. Messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the travail that has befallen us. How our fathers went down into Egypt, and we dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians dealt well, ill with us and our fathers. And then in verse 16, the deliverance. How is the deliverance described? And when we cried unto God, he heard our voice, and sent a malach, and brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of your border. Now, just how are we to understand God sending a malach and bringing us forth out of Egypt? Which malach? Do we mean here angel? As a tantalizing possibility, of course, we don't read anything in the story of the Exodus that describes a specific angel being sent with a mission to bring us forth out of Egypt. Uh, but then... Um, there certainly was somebody who was sent with a mission to bring us forth out of Egypt. His name, of course, was Moses. So in referring to this Malach, do we mean angel? Or do we mean the prophet? The prophet Moses, who is likewise serving as God's messenger in just the same vein that when Moses sent Malachim from Kadesh unto the king of Edom, he was also sending messengers. Well, they were Moses' messengers. Moses, in turn, is God's messenger. To consider another example that is admittedly also ambiguous. At the beginning of Judges, chapter 2, and the Malach of God came up from Gilgal to Bochim and he says 
words of rebuke, of chastisement to the people of Israel. And by the time we get to verse 4, after these words of rebuke, and it came to pass when the Malach of God spoke these words unto all the people of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. Maybe that's the reason the second location specified is called Bochim, which means weeping in Hebrew. Well, just what's being described in these verses, this Malach of God going from the Gilgal to Bochim. Is it an angel? If it is, of course, it would pertain to another question that we are, after all, going to need to address presently. We get in the third question for later today, the question of do angels move in this world? We're not going to discuss that right now. It is, of course, tantalizing to consider just why the Malach in Judges chapter 2 is going from Gilgal to Bochim. Moreover, the very fact that what this Malach speaks is heard by all Israel raises, of course, a question as to who is privy the message of the Malach. Is the Malach here an angel? We have an ancient tradition that would clearly render Malach here as well, as was the case in Numbers chapter 20. Not as angel, but rather as messenger. Messenger by tradition. Pinchas, the son of El Azar and grandson of Aaron. Pinchas, the great nephew of Moses, prophet in this period. And he is described as a Malach of God, not to imply that he's an angel, but rather that he's a messenger. A messenger and faithfully discharging the mission that God gives him. To take one final example here that is perhaps less ambiguous, although still is open to interpretation. In Chronicles 2, in chapter 36, verse 15, And God, the God of their fathers, sent to them by his Malachim, in the Hebrew, Malachav, which is the construct form. Sending be times and often because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Words of rebuke. They were the words of rebuke by the Malach of God, God's messenger, at the beginning of the book of Judges, at the beginning of Israel's sojourn in the land of Israel, more or less. And at the end of the story in Chronicles, we read it was an ongoing process. In verse 16, but they mocked the Malachim of God, Malachai Elohim, and despised his words, God's words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people, till there was no remedy. And of course, the supreme irony here is that perhaps one of the strongest indications that we aren't speaking of angels, but rather of human messengers, is the extent to which the people are mocking them. It's hard enough to imagine mocking prophets, but mocking angels? And altogether, to what extent would people operating on so low a level that they would mock them even be able to apprehend them? So, of course, here again, 
the implication is when we're speaking of these malachim, the malachim indeed shouldn't be taken to refer to angels. They are simply God's messengers. And God's messengers come in all sorts of different forms. This is, of course, a critical initial observation in our progression in trying to get a sense of just what the angels are. Again, as expressed in this opening question in our series today. But to sharpen the question somewhat further, I think it's important for us to consider we certainly don't intend here to imply that what these angels, messengers, signify is something inconsequential. Surely isn't anything inconsequential. Just consider. You undoubtedly all recall the description of the tabernacle, the tabernacle as the template for the holy temple to be built here in Jerusalem. And in Exodus chapter 25, we read about just what was at the focal point, the heart of the tabernacle, and likewise, the heart of the holy temple. Among the various vessels that were placed inside the tabernacle, of course, the first that is described is the Holy Ark. And in particular, the significance of the Holy Ark, as expressed in chapter 25, in verse 22, God says to Moses, and there I will meet, I will commune with you, and I will speak with you from above the ark cover, the holy ark. But there's more specificity than just over the ark. From between the two cherubs, the cherubs that are upon the ark of the testimony. What are these cherubs? We read about them in somewhat greater detail in the commands that are stated in the preceding verses that pertain to the construction of the ark cover. And in particular, in verse 19, and make one cherub on the one end of the ark cover and the other cherub on the other end of the ark cover, shall you make the cherubs on the two ends of, of them, and in verse 20, the cherubs shall stretch out their wings on high, overspreading the covering with their wings, and their faces will look one to another, toward the covering shall the faces of the cherubs be. It was there, between the cherubs these representations of winged angels that God communes with Moses. In other words, at the very center, center in essence and even in geography of the tabernacle and of the holy temple, we have these representations of angels clearly to that extent the principle that God sends angels is so central, so fundamental, it is highlighted at the very focal point of the Holy Temple and of God's communion with his prophet. Now, at face value, this should be very disturbing to us because it seems almost glaringly inconsistent. If on the one hand, you see just how significant belief in angels is. So there be no mistake about it. Affirming our conviction that God sends angels is so central that there it is, right in the center of the tabernacle and the holy temple. The ark cover, the holy ark. 
That's where God communes with Moses. You see how central the idea of angels is. Maybe we should also note, besides the extent to which we encounter angels all the time, repeatedly, throughout the Bible. That same prophet Moses, when he first comes to the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, you remember how that encounter begins in chapter 3, in verse 2, and the angel of God, it's also Malach, literally messenger. But here certainly it means angel. The angel of God appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Moses' inaugural prophecy. And it starts with seeing an angel. So on the one hand, we see just how central, how essential the idea that God sends angels is. And on the other hand, we don't even know what he means. We don't know if we're talking about angels, messengers. We use a vocabulary, and the vocabulary is entirely ambiguous. Doesn't this seem disturbing? That is, to what extent do we really have a clear sense of just what the Malach is. And perhaps that's precisely the point. The essential point that we need to appreciate is indeed the extent to which God speaks to us through Malachim. Whether Malachim in the particular context mean angels, human messengers, prophets, or other types of people, or anything else, that's all secondary. Central point to appreciate is it is through some vehicle or other of messengers that God communicates with us. Maybe one of the most dramatic illustrations of the extent to which Malach messenger, angel, is simply that, a divine messenger of some sort. And just what sort is of, at best, secondary significance or less? Consider Psalm 104, verse 4. We read here in the Hebrew, Oseh Malachav Ruchot, translated, who makes winds his Malachim. So do we understand the wind as angels? Doubtful. But he makes winds, his messengers, flaming fire, his ministers, even inanimate objects like wind and fire. They too can be identified as Malach to the extent that they serve as the vehicle or vehicles of doing God's bidding. What's critical then for us is not to be able to identify Malach specifically as this or as that, as angel, prophet, or other human being. It doesn't even have to be any of the above. It can even be some simple, ordinary, inanimate substance like wind. But if it serves as means through which God's mission is achieved, it's a malach. And in this vein, to cite maybe a deeper example of the same idea, you'll recall in the book of Daniel, in chapter 6, when we read of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den because of the subterfuge of the nobility who contrive to get Daniel in trouble with the royal edict that was promulgated by Darius. So Darius comes in anguish to the pit of the lions early the next morning to see if Daniel is still alive. And Daniel says to the king, 
chapter 6, verse 23, my God has sent his Malach. This is in Aramaic, so the construct form is Malachei. But it's the same word. God sent his Malach and has shut the lion's mouths. And they haven't hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me, and also before you, O king, have I done no hurt. Well, how do we understand this statement? That God sent an angel in some literal sense of the word angel to muzzle up the lions and clamp their mouths shut? Or, rather, well, wind can be described as God's malach. Why not some animal nature that transforms what was otherwise the nature of the lions into being docile and harmless creatures? So it's that animal nature that serves as God's messenger. And that's what shuts the lion's mouth. So, of course, here, too, we readily appreciate malach is an ambiguous term. It means angels, but it means so much more. And, of course, having then come to the realization that malach means all these different things, we're certainly equipped on one plane to respond to the first question, that is, the realization that there are so many contradictions in the way angels are described is at least in part simply a reflection that it's not so many ways angels are described, but rather a reflection of there being so many different ways in which malachim, the malach, appears in the Bible. And since malach means so many different things, malach means messenger, but there are so many different levels so many different planes, so many different dynamisms of God's messengers. And again, what's essential for us to always remember is believing that God has messengers, that God sends messengers, that God has a mission that is discharged through his messengers in this world. That's critical. But what form the messengers take that's changeable, that is readily, maybe even always, in flux. So recognizing that, of course, it shouldn't surprise us that there are so many different ways, even apparently contradictory ways, in which malachim appear, because they mean all different things. That's at least a partial resolution of the first question. But of course, only partial. Because when one considers the specific example that the question introduces, merely stating that malach is an ambiguous term will be of little avail. Isaiah sees angels with six wings, and Ezekiel sees angels with four wings. Does Jewish tradition resolve all the inconsistencies in these descriptions? So, before considering the specifics of Isaiah and Ezekiel, as for whether we have traditions to resolve all the inconsistencies in these descriptions, I think you can well imagine what the answer necessarily is. We've been delving into the Bible, plunging into its depths as Jews ever since the Bible was given. There aren't any stones that haven't at all been turned in the Bible from the perspective of our traditions. So, of course, in that vein, to consider the specifics of Isaiah seeing angels with six wings and Ezekiel with four wings, of course, we can't simply write this off as a reflection of the ambiguities of the word malach. First of all, because the two instances here do not employ the word malach. That's, of course, one point to be borne in mind. But second of all, because that in both instances, the context clearly indicates we're talking about 
holy heavenly angels is something that we certainly can't avoid. They have wings. Well, if they have wings, they obviously aren't merely terrestrial messengers, prophets, or other human beings. So maybe before we attempt to grapple with the glaring inconsistency between the six wings and the four wings, it behoves us to take a quick look at at the very least the beginning of question number two. We'll return to question number two later. But are angels spiritual beings or physical beings altogether? First of all, to borrow from the glaring inconsistency between Isaiah's and Ezekiel's descriptions to respond that first brush to that first line of question number two, if angels were physical beings, we would indeed be justified in expecting all angels to appear the same way to all physical observers. The very fact that they appear differently to different observers already indicates that whatever is being observed is not some definitive, unambiguous, physical body. Angels are spiritual. Angels are, we might say, incorporeal intellects. No body at all. Pure spirit. Of course, they are described with the attributes of physical beings. That shouldn't surprise us. We're very well familiar with the extent to which the Bible always uses anthropomorphisms in describing even God with what appear to be the attributes of human beings. So, of course, we know very well that when we read about God saving Israel in bondage in Egypt with mighty hand and outstretched arm. We don't mean any physical hand or arm. It's a metaphor. The angels are also described as having physical attributes. But they don't have bodies. They're spiritual beings. But now, I feel it is critical for me to emphasize the following point. If you ask me, do angels have bodies? Well, you've already heard my answer. The very fact that angels are described in so many different ways makes it clear to me that any sort of definitive body in a literal sense couldn't possibly exist. The descriptions, therefore, are all figurative, metaphorical. On the other hand, if you ask me, do angels have wings? I will respond immediately with no ambiguity at all. Of course they do. Definitely they have wings. There may be a question as to how many wings. Isaiah says six, Ezekiel says four. Angels definitely have wings. Are you disturbed by an apparent contradiction here? On the one hand, I tell you angels don't have bodies. On the other hand, I tell you they do have wings. Well, of course, you shouldn't be disturbed. What that simply reflects is the realization that whatever we mean by wings for angels, we don't mean physical wings. We don't mean if you'll pardon my expressing myself in these terms, the sort of angels that are depicted in classic Renaissance art. Angels have wings. They aren't big white dove wings. They aren't physical wings at all. What do wings signify? Because if we're going to address the specifics of the contradiction, the apparent contradiction, between Isaiah's description of the angels and Ezekiel's, if the conflict revolves around wings, we need to consider what wings mean. So allow me to present two nuances that are both undoubtedly part of a much broader picture of understanding just what sort of symbols are employed in the Bible in the description of angels. On the one hand, 
on perhaps the most obvious plane, when we consider from our point of view, and again remember, the prophets are always speaking from a human point of view. What the significance of wings is, what the difference is between an animal that have, has wings and an animal that does not. Of course, the obvious intuitive answer is all animals that don't have wings move around in one plane on the surface of the earth. They can move around in all four directions on the plane of the earth, but that's it. When you have wings, you're endowed with the wherewithal to move up and down as well. Another dimension of existence. Indeed, not just some other dimension of existence, something that from time immemorial for human beings signified perhaps more dramatically than anything else what we as earth-bound creatures lack. We can't fly. There was always that dream of flight that characterized humanity. And of course, it is in that vein that by identifying angels as having wings, as being able to fly, what we intimate, what the words of the prophets are intended to imply is that angels have a dimension of completeness that we as human beings necessarily lack. And uh, let there be, lest there be any misunderstanding here, I know nowadays we have planes and rockets. I hope it's clear to all of us that that new prowess that we have, thanks to modern technology, is completely irrelevant with respect to the metaphor of flight for angels. Because it's a metaphor, after all, for the spiritual heights that angels attain, that we as human beings, even equipped with our planes and our rockets, are still sorely incapable of attaining. So the wings then, first and foremost, signify that the ability to transcend, the ability to go beyond the limitations that characterize this worldly existence. An additional dimension that we can't help but emphasize, in particular, given the context in which we read about the wings in Isaiah, is in the description of the angels in Isaiah, Chapter 6, verse 2. We aren't really told about the angels having six wings. We're told something very specific about the roles of these wings. Seraphim, a word for angels, stood, as it were, ministering before God. Each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two, he covered his legs, and with two, he flew. So, of course, we've already discussed those two wings of flight. What about the other four? They're all about covering. On manifold planes, we use the Hebrew for wing, kanaf, to signify covering. Kanaf also refers to the corner of a garment. The garment is also covering. And to what end would we describe angels as having wings in order to imply covering? I think the answer should be clear to all of us. Covered. Hidden. Inaccessible. Beyond our ken beyond our comprehension. This, of course, inevitably is a critical component of what we mean when we speak of God's holy angels. That while some people, at least, are able to behold angels, undoubtedly not all of us, but some of us 
that doesn't mean we comprehend them. Nor does that mean that the heavenly realm has suddenly been transformed into something that lies within the scope of human grasp. It's not. So, of course, in this vein, when we consider the significance of the wings, if I can integrate the two aspects that we just discussed, that hiddenness, that concealment, that inaccessibility, necessarily, of course, goes hand in hand with that additional dimension that flight implies, going above and beyond, in a spiritual sense, what we can conceive in the context of this world. The wings. The wings, of course, then, not as physical wings, but simultaneously, not as some mere metaphor. We mean wings. Just as when we speak of angels, we mean angels. Just the angels aren't physical and neither are their wings. But that doesn't mean either the angels or the wings are any less real. And of course, we have a problem in this world generally. We live in a world of physicality, and we're liable to get into the habit of thinking that things need to be physical in order for them to be real. Well, that's obviously a problem we have to get over. From our perspective, things that transcend the bounds of physicality are not less real. If anything, on the contrary, they are more real. Just consider, love, is that physical? Trust, faith, beauty, are those merely physical constructs? The significance of those words lies in something that goes far beyond physicality. To be non-physical, then, is not to be less real, but to be more real. Of course, the ultimate illustration of this is when we speak of God. God isn't physical. And it's not because he is less real than that which is physical, but rather more real, beyond the bounds of anything physical. To describe God in physical terms, on the contrary, would be limiting God with the trappings of mortality. God goes beyond physicality. And of course, in that vein, so do angels. So, returning to the question then, why six wings versus four wings? The answer that we find in the Jewish tradition in understanding these verses is, on the one hand, fairly straightforward, but on the other hand, I think, truly profound. It pertains to considering the different circumstances, the different roles of the two prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Isaiah and Ezekiel were both prophets of God with God's missions. But Isaiah lived at a time when the Holy Temple was standing in its glory in Jerusalem. And what of Ezekiel? At the very beginning of the book of Ezekiel, we read of the circumstances of his prophecy. He is in exile in Babylon, where the nobility of Judah had already been exiled prior to the destruction of the temple in the exile of King Jehoiachin. The temple is still standing, but barely. And by divine decree, it is already doomed to be destroyed. That's the difference between what Isaiah sees and what Ezekiel sees. That is, once again, I'm going to reiterate, the change doesn't happen in, as it were, the heavenly realm. The heavenly realm is a spiritual realm. It isn't bounded by time and it isn't affected in time. But then, since it's not in any way a physical realm, what the prophet sees is a reflection not of some kind of external physical reality, but rather 
prophet's ability to see. And of course, we readily appreciate that when I say see here, I'm also using that verb metaphorically because it's not physical sight. It's not seeing with the eyes. Seeing with the mind or the heart or the soul. The circumstances of the prophet determine then what the prophet is capable of seeing. Ezekiel living when he did on the brink of destruction, immersed already in exile, sees a diminished heavenly retinue. The angels are diminished. They don't represent transcendence to the same extent that they did. They don't signify the hidden realm that is above and beyond to the extent that Isaiah saw. The world is changing. And what the prophet sees when he sees the angels changes as well. So, I hope on that plane we can summarize our response to question number one and on this note we'll conclude our discussion of it that on the one hand it shouldn't surprise us that there are so many contradictions in the way angels are described once we appreciate that we aren't speaking necessarily of angels but malachim with all of the manifold different meanings that malachim have and even when we're speaking of angels once we recognize, of course, that angels are not physical beings, they are spiritual beings, you see the angel as you're capable of seeing. The critical foundation, I repeat, as expressed at the focal point of the Holy Temple, is that God has messengers whom he sends to us in this world. There was never a breakdown of communication. God always communicates with us through one means or another. Just what means? It depends. And that's why there are so many different views and so many different perspectives and so many different types of malachim. But the critical foundation is they are indeed God's messengers to the world. And on that note, I think we should conclude our discussion of this first question.